My name is Tony De Groot. Uh, of course, we're here in the Central Valley, California. Uh, we've been here since uh, 1966, and uh, yeah, I've been in the dairy business ever since. Okay, and tell me a little bit about uh, how the dairy got started and how it's changed since you first got involved. Oh boy, how it has changed! Uh, I just happened to pull up a record. Uh, some old records that we have out here since 1967. And we're pulling about them. We were on the honor roll in those days, milking about 500 some odd cows, and uh, we were sitting at 13,000 pounds of milk. And, uh, and now we're pulling 27,000 uh, plus. So you can see how our bitter fat, our solids, and everything else uh, grew through during that period of time. Tell me something from your past that has helped you throughout your dairy career. Some uh, experience in your life that was beneficial um, to you, either at a young age or you know just starting out, or maybe it was in the middle of your career. But something that uh, has stuck with you. I used to be a baker, and when I immigrated into this country, I moved into Rochester, Minnesota, and I worked right across the Mayo Clinic, and I baked there for quite a few years, and uh, so I learned about nutrition. And it didn't have nothing to do with cattle in those days. I mean, I was just into nutrition, and, and especially in a clinic town like that, you, uh, uh, you learn a lot. And that carried over into the, the dairy business. Because since I got in, uh, some kind of a, what you call it, in Baker's disease, I had to uh, uh, quit. And they said, oh, if you go to California, you have a chance to get over it. So I moved to California. And we had to make a living somehow. So anyway, I. I baked here in California yet for three and a half, four years. Then the same thing came back again. So I had to start from scratch again. It was awful hard for me to come out of nice chef's clothes and get into a shitty old barn and learn how to milk a cow. So, I mean, it was just something that I had to do to survive, and, uh, and we did. We were very fortunate and we were blessed with what we uh, were able to accomplish out here. What do you think uh, dairies will need to do in the future to be able to continue to still be in the dairy business? It's a very tough question to, uh, to, to answer. Uh, first of all, if we go according to the population, and uh, they're suggesting that, uh, or they're talking about it, it's going to be about 9.1 billion in about 20 some odd years, how are we going to feed the world? And uh, that's why we have to find all kinds of methods and. Uh, yeah, just try to get more milk out of these cows. Now you say, well, how, how in the world are we getting, going to get more milk? But since 1966 and today, we have over double amount of milk out of our cows. Are we going to be able to double it again? I kind of doubt it. I'm kind of a guy that I like to, like to try things. Some have been successful, some have not been successful. I mean, they were not all successful. But you gotta keep trying. Uh, what we did, for instance, uh, for, in this particular area, when we started here, this was all wild pasture. There was very little farm land out here. And so we started to grow sugar beets. Because sugar beets is about the only thing that grows into alkali dirt. You don't get the tonnets, but you get a very high percentage of sugar. So to develop all this ground, we started to grow sugar beets. So, we still, as of today, still grow sugar beets. It'll clean up our ground. It is a very good uh, source of, for environmental issues. And it gives you a highly digestible food. So we are still growing every year between 150 and, and 200 acres of sugar beets and incorporate them into our feed, mm. into our ration. Uh, we're about, to the best of my knowledge, the only one that's doing that. It's been successful for us. Uh, it's, it's work. I mean, it's not something that, that comes easy. Uh, it's been expensive, uh, but it, it, uh, it's a good, good source of feed. Uh, sugar beets for us, uh, we have grown them for the sugar industry uh, probably for 35 years now we've been growing them. Uh, it's been the last 15 years that the sugar industry here in California died uh, due to pricing and different sugar availabilities. Um, so we started feeding them to our cows. We were already familiar with growing them. Uh, we plant in the fall 
and we harvest again in the fall. Uh, so for us, it's a 12 month crop. We will take it out with our corn silage at the same time. Uh, we grind them up uh, with a, a tub grinder and we doze it up straight into the pile. And uh, we'll take our corn silage uh, drier than uh, some people might like. Uh, but we do that in order for it to absorb what moisture it can from the sugar beets. Uh, sugar beets will be at 85% uh, moisture. This sugar beet here is about two months old. Uh, and uh, yeah, it will continue to grow. Our tonnage uh, that we've, maybe not quite that big, but our t tonnage that uh, uh, we've been getting on, a, on an average is 60 to 65 ton per acre. And uh, we've, we've gone up as high as uh, 70 plus, uh, not across the whole ranch, but uh, we've gotten up that high. Once the sugar beet is harvested, it's brought over here, stacked up, and then we use a, it's for the most part, it's a pulverizer, I like to call it. It'll take the big sugar beet and just hammer it down to the size of about my fist or smaller. And then we'll take a loader bucket and scoop it up. And as they're pushing the silage up, they'll just mix the silage up with the sugar beets at the same time they're dozing it up. It, it mixes very well. As a truck dumps, we'll take a loader bucket and dump on top of that. And the dozer will push them both up together. And they do kind of mix up uh, together on the way up. Our goal was to try to get the corn more usable to the cow. So in our, in our minds, uh, putting the extra uh, sugar in with the corn silage, uh, along with inoculants, uh, we're kind of feeding those bugs a little bit longer, and we're getting this corn in our minds to pre-digest before it even gets to the cow. So by the time the cow is getting this corn, it's uh, more, more useful. So natural fermentation. What are some of the commodities, you know, 10 years ago you would have been feeding that are just not priced right in the market these days? Oh, I think we probably would have fed more. Uh, back then we fed hominy, we fed mill run. Uh, we probably fed a lot more uh, citrus. We had a lot of fruit waste that was pretty much free. Almond holes were priced, I don't know, they were half the price of corn all the time or less? Oh yeah, I, I, when you started with almond holes, I was probably one of the first ones in this area at least that started to feed almond holes. Well, they said, well, you don't feed wood to a cow. Yeah. You know, they were more or less thinking about the shell. But, you know, I looked at that, so we started to feed a couple of pounds per cow, and a little bit more. And now we're up to 10 pounds per cow. Mm. The only problem was, in those days, they would practically give it to you because it was bedding. Yeah, if it's free, it works. Yeah. Uh, but it, the almond hole has survived because it's actually, an almond is a peach. So an almond hole is actually a dried peach. Uh, 5,000 years ago, somebody changed the peach into that, and that's what it is. So, dried peaches are pretty good feed, um, but you know they were priced a lot better back then. Um, they've they've kept up because of their digestibility and their value to the cow. But a lot of the other byproducts, you know, that we used to pay half the price or even less than half the price if you took a volume. Mill run. I mean, we used to buy mill run for forty dollars if you took that's ten right. loads. Yeah. When corn was one hundred and twenty, but uh, today mill runs discounted twenty dollars and for its energy value just doesn't make a lot of sense. So the advantage has to come from somewhere else. And uh, it either comes from doing a more efficient job um, in harvesting the way Tony's system is set up or taking the milk out of the cow or, or from the ground, you know, more unique ways of, of farming. Well, I, this dairy of all the dairies I do is probably unique in the fact that um, there, was a, there was a Nobel laureate named Linus Pauling who came from the Bay Area and he said that Someone asked him how he had got two Nobels, and he said he was an idea man. Um, and they said, well, does that mean you're smarter than everyone? And he said, no, I just have a lot of ideas. Um, that's kind of Tony's thing. I mean, oh, Tony, Tony has a lot of ideas, and um, some are good, some are bad. We try the best ones, and uh, some work, some don't. But I think you have to keep, you have to keep thinking of new ways to do it. Uh, you can't, if you sit in the old ways, uh, you'll be passed by. So. Uh, the beets are one thing. He, he confirmed that they fed him in Holland, you know, 30, 40 years ago. <clears throat> and then my digestion, you know, digesting them in a cow to get true digestion, you find that a beet is 90% digestible where our corn silage is maybe 45. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, you know, a lot of our forages, it's a desert climate. 
so a lot of the forages aren't conducive to, to uh, digestion in a ruminant. Although the beet grows underground and the UV doesn't affect the fiber, so you have beet pulp and sugar, which is a lot more digestible than corn that grows at 107 degrees. So using all those different variables, um, Tony's always been open to um, try things, you know, and that's, that's pretty unique because it takes, uh, it takes courage to do that. A lot of people uh, <clears throat> don't want to do that. They don't want to rock the boat. So. Tell me a little bit about uh, the, your involvement in the, the DEMP feeding trial specifically and how you got involved and just walk me through kind of the chronology of how that uh, all started. Well, the, uh, the idea, I guess, came from Alltech because um, in a discussion, um, the owner of Alltech was discussing with uh, a guy named Pete Van Seuss from Cornell what would be the best thing. You know, he said, well, what if you could feed microbes to a cow in such a quantity that they would go past the rumen and fall into the true stomach just the way the bugs are created in the rumen? And, you know, Van Seuss said, well, that would be wonderful, but who, who could do that? I mean, and... Um, Alltech was able to come up with a method of uh, producing these microbes, yeast, at a level um, that we feed uh, three-quarter pound of yeast of microbes. So probably half of that bypasses the rumen, so we're working with uh, a third of a pound of you know, bugs that we didn't have to create in the rumen. We just bypassed the rumen and dropped them in the true stomach. So that's allowed us to feed a lower protein diet because the protein that's, that's given to us by the NRC is based off producing the microbes in the rumen at a 17 protein, where at this dairy we feed about a 15 uh, protein because we already bypassed the rumen and dropped those bugs into the true stomach. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, <clears throat> we're able to feed less protein, which is good for the, good for the land and the, the, the environment. I guess we're gonna be pushed more and more on how much nitrogen we can put out. Um, and it's cost effective depending on the price of uh, uh, canola or soybean, whatever the protein source is, because we can feed less of that. But, but the chronology of it was just the idea that you could feed that much yeast. Uh, most, most yeast is fed in grams, nine grams, six grams, two grams. Um, you know, we feed three quarter pound of it. And, and that's sparked my interest because it had never been done before. Those are the kind of ideas that we're gonna have to have to try to increase efficiencies beyond, uh, you know, just buying cheap commodities, I guess. Do you think that idea will be replicatable elsewhere? based on what you've seen here. Yeah, yeah, I think it will. It's, it's really gonna, it's gonna depend on um, what their costs are to produce this product. I mean, um, the microbes themselves, plus, um, yeah, it's just, it allows us to feed a lot less of a, of a, of a, a substrate to the cow, you know, whether it's hay or corn or anything, because the rumen in a lot of ways is not doing us any favors. You know, the rumen was created to stand on a hill and haul in somewhere and eat grass. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, we try to understand it, but it's really not our friend in efficiencies uh, because it's complex and it's hard to figure out sometimes. It's, and it's not, in a, you know, it's not in a computer that'll tell you the answer. Mm. You know, sometimes it's an art. It's like uh, Tony said he was a baker. It's, you know, the best bakers are artists. Probably the best cow feeders are artists too. Mm. Alltech Western Regional Manager Tyler Bramble says Alltech made its DEMP feeding technology available just a few years ago. During the Global Dairy 500 meeting that was held back in Kentucky two years ago, um, that's really where the idea became public. And we pulled a group of um, who we thought were key innovative producers from around the country into a small room and shared with them the ideas, the concepts, and those sorts of things. And immediately following that, um, I followed up with Tony and a handful of other dairymen, um, and, and we got the product uh, trialed and, and started. How did you explain uh, the concept in that early meeting? Well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I prefaced it, I suppose, is this is something that's never been done before, but is really exciting, and essentially we're feeding microbial protein directly to uh, the cow now. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a totally new concept, um, I think, for the nutritionists and for the dairymen um, to get their head around. And, and um, both Randy and Tony asked lots of good questions and 
you know, we were willing to take that leap of faith and uh, it's, it's worked well. Yeah, the product's really starting to take off. We have um, probably six to eight dairies in California that are currently on it and have been on it for quite some time. Um, and globally throughout Europe, um, the numbers of dairies going on the product are picking up as well. So I, I really think it's the future and I think we're just kind of uh, fine tuning. Uh, you know, we're learning about it every day and every month, but um, you know, we've seen, we've seen um, good production responses and uh, the like. So uh, yeah, I think, I think there's certainly a, a the future of many more dairies will be on it. Tell me a little bit about, uh, as you observed, this group of dairies who have been trying this, some of the things that are similar between each, each of the dairies that, uh, you know, kind of build a profile of, of the type of dairy that this would work for. Yeah, I think the application is pretty widespread. I think the, the early adopters, you know, the people that are on it, I would say, would tend to be early adopters, people that are seeking to gain an edge, people that are looking one, two, three years down the road. Um, as in terms of opportunities and, and trying new things. Um, so I would say the probably the common characteristic is a desire to improve. Um, I think as Tony mentioned or Randy uh, pr prior to me, you know, if you do things the way you've always done um, with the economics and the volatility in the marketplace, I think um, those dairies will, will uh, struggle. Tony Sr. showed us one of his non-feed-related innovations, his milking parlor, which he developed more than 25 years ago. Okay, so instead of milk in front and back, we milk in the circle. Oh. And by doing that, we can milk with real low vacuum. Our cows probably milk twice as fast as anybody else's. So you don't, uh, you don't pull on the cow, the cow just lets it go by itself. In other words, there would be a massage more than milk. We have a double 45 herring or parallel on this facility, and it's for our vacuum, we are pulling a 10, 10 psi vacuum, 10 half, uh, and we're able to do this with a different pulsation mechanism. We have two pulsators for every cow. And this allows us to milk one, one quarter at a time. Uh, going, yeah, instead of a <clears throat> front and back method, we, uh, we milk one, one at a time going in a circle. We're able to use 10 PSI because of our pulsation system. The quad pulsation, as we like to call it, uh, allows us to have three quarters being squeezed on and it, that helps hold the machine up instead of using more vacuum. Uh, so three quarters are being held on to while one is being let go and the claw and the liners are held up by a combination of vacuum and, and pulsation. We got lines that go from 8 inch to 10 inch to 12 inch. The reasoning for the larger pipeline is to increase the amount of volume of air or vacuum we have on in the system. Uh, because of the low vacuum, if one cow kicks the machine off, the next cow could very possibly lose the machine also. So we have, we make up for that by having larger capacity to maintain that equal vacuum through the whole system. We had, to, we actually experimented with different angles and positions of where the milk went into the main milk line. Um, as you can see, we got a certain angle and at a different spot on the line itself so that the milk will come down, run along down inside the, the pipeline and without any splashing to maximize our volume capacity for our vacuum. This is our liner here. Um, it is a three-piece liner. Most liners are one piece. Uh, we have uh, a ring on the inside, this yellow thing there. You can see that, right? Yeah. This allows us to change how large the hole is on the end and minimize the amount of gap between where it will actually pinch and the top. Um, 
and then the liner itself would actually squeeze on the cows and then the line going to the to the claw so we call it, we call it the three piece liner we hand make all of the all of these uh, we put the rings in ourselves. Uh, our somatic cell count is, on average, this facility approximately 86. Or in the pay, this year 2011 was 109. Yeah, on our other facility that has been going for 25 years, with this system, our somatic cell count is 62 for the year of 2011. What would your advice be to uh, other dairymen throughout the country? Just don't do things like you have done for the last 25 years. We got to have new research and really get into new innovations because we have to get more out of the pounds of grain that we're feeding, more out of the pounds of hay that we're feeding, and especially corn silage.